For a very long time, human beings have been trying to figure out the nature of existence because we want to know exactly who or what we are. Why are we here? You see, if we could just figure out the nature of the universe, maybe it'll give some clue as to who we are or what we're supposed to be. And if you happen to be religiously inclined, of course, you also have to factor in the existence of God. That's today's episode of Authentic. Now, human beings have been trying to boil down the nature of our existence and the nature of the universe for thousands of years. And I find it curious that so many of the clay tablets we dig out of the earth talk about questions regarding the meaning of life. I mean, some of these tablets, they talk about things like census data or royal bookkeeping or some king's triumph in war. But the one thing that keeps on popping up over and over and over again is the question of meaning. Who in the world are we? Why was I born into this universe? Am I really just a biological machine, some kind of accident of physics and biology? Or is there a reason that you and I are here? And is there anybody out there, I mean, somewhere out there in the universe who knows that we're here, or for that matter, cares that we're here? And how do you know for sure that your existence is even real? How do I know that my daily experience is not just a figment of my imagination, an illusion created by the chemistry of my brain? How do I know that all of this, you and me, right now, it's not just a dream? Maybe things like love or passion or hate or inspiration are nothing but an illusion. I mean, how do I know that I'm not just a biological experiment somewhere out there in the universe, just a, a brain sitting on a tray with a 15-year-old high school kid prodding it with a scalpel because I'm his science project and he's accidentally creating every experience I think I'm having. Of course, that, that's not the way they talked about it in these ancient clay tablets like this one from the ruins of Nineveh. But the questions are exactly the same. We've been struggling with the same things ever since we learned the art of writing. Our ancient ancestors seriously probed just about every corner of human experience looking for answers. Last night, some of these tablets say, I had a crazy dream. What did that mean? And why is it that all life on this planet seems to rely on the sun? And what exactly would make my life meaningful and great. I mean, maybe if I go conquer all my neighboring countries and make them worship me, then my life will mean something. I mean, if we get right to the root of it, everybody's been looking for the very same thing. We're looking for the reason we're here. That's the question that motivates almost everything we do. Because somehow we're not very happy with the idea that we just happen to be here, but it doesn't really mean anything. And if you think about it, the fact that we ask that question at all is really pretty significant. Because if you were just a biological machine, some random accident, a leftover from the Big Bang, then why in the world would you have an impulse to go out there looking for meaning? I mean, think about this. Does your laptop care about the meaning of its existence? It does a lot of artificial thinking all day long. It does calculations faster than your brain can. It takes care of spreadsheets and communications. And these days, that computer can even run your house. But you know that your laptop isn't sitting there on the kitchen table wondering where it came from, why it exists, and what its purpose is. Because that would be weird. Consciousness and self-awareness don't just happen. And if your computer does appear to care, I mean, if Siri or Alexa asks you the occasional meaningful questions, you would know immediately that somebody had programmed it to seem that way because it doesn't happen all by itself. So let, let's consider this possibility. Let's consider the possibility that somebody did put us here on purpose and that same somebody programmed us to ask these kinds of questions because there's something we're supposed to discover something we're supposed to learn. 
If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, an ancient book of Jewish wisdom and found in the Old Testament, you'll find this statement that looks, well, a little simplistic at first, but the longer you think about it, the more profound it becomes. And you find this statement on the heels of an ancient poem that actually became a number one hit for the birds back in 1965. You, you might remember it. To everything, I won't sing, <laughs> to everything, turn, 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 there is a season, a time to every purpose under heaven. Yeah, that comes from Ecclesiastes. They got it from chapter 3. And it only goes to prove that the questions that haunt the human race today are the very same questions we were asking, well, 3,000 years ago. Now you'll notice, those ancient lyrics assume there's got to be a purpose for our existence. So maybe let's just do a little bit of reading theater for a couple of minutes and let me read you some of this ancient poetry. This is from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 beginning in verse 1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Now that has got to be one of the most foundational poems in the history of human writing. And when you're reading this, it just kind of feels right. So let me ask you why. Why do we assume there's a purpose and a time for anything? Why is it that we can't seem to let go of that idea? You start to find the answer in the next few words. And this is the part of this ancient passage that unfortunately never made it to the top 10 charts back in 1965. I'm going to continue in verse 9, and you never know. Maybe we'll spend the rest of this show unpacking what we're about to read because, well, it's just that profound. And I promise, this is going to give you enough to think about until the next time we meet. So, here we go with what I think is the most important part of this passage. And I want you to notice the assumptions buried in this text. Verse 9, What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. So there you have it again. It's the biggest question in the world. Every day you get out of bed and you go through the motions. You go to work, you go to school, you go out looking for a job, you plan a day of retirement. But whatever you do, you feel driven to do something. For some reason, you and I are painfully aware of how short this life is, in a way that dogs and cats probably aren't. I mean, animals don't seem to struggle with the idea of mortality. But you and I live under the assumption that time is a limited gift. This is something you can't afford to waste. And the older you get, the more you realize that one single lifetime is just a tiny blip on the radar of eternity, a period of time so short that it almost seems, well, cruel. We have to spend most of our lives just surviving, which makes some people wonder why we put in all this effort. I mean, if, if life is just sleeping and eating and breathing and reproducing, what's the point? Everything you create, and every child you bring into this existence is just going to occupy a world where you one day will no longer exist. And for a lot of people, that seems kind of futile. Then, of course, you have to ask yourself why this would even bother you. Because if you and I were just biological computers, we would simply get to the end of our usefulness and we would power down and never even think about it. But for some reason, all of this really bothers us. We live, we suffer, we die, and for some reason all of that seems really, really wrong. I mean, I, I can't even imagine how many billions of words the human race has written on this very subject. The idea that life seems short and cruel and pointless. But at the same time, we cling to life and it seems far too short. Look, I've got to take a quick break, but I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, 
cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. There's just something about this existence that doesn't make sense, not rationally, and that really bothers us. It's like there's bro this broken tooth at the back of your mouth and your tongue just can't leave it alone. You have to keep going back and exploring the question of our existence over and over. It reminds me of a famous passage from Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. I don't know if you had to read this book in college, but I did. And at one point, he says one of the most heartbreaking things in the world. And, and I guess the reason it's heartbreaking is because we know it's true. And he's speaking about living through war that awful moment when the human race manages to strip all human life of meaning. Here's what he says. In such a condition, that's war, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And here it comes. Here's the troubling part. And the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Now, I don't happen to like that perspective, but I have to admit there's some truth to this. For most people, life really can be lonely, nasty, brutal, and short. And that bothers me. But why? I mean, if the universe is just tooth and claw, survival of the fittest, then what Thomas Hobbes is describing is exactly the way things are supposed to be. And it shouldn't bother me because that's just the nature of an indifferent universe. I mean, sure, I want to avoid pain. Everybody does. Because it's, well, unpleasant. But beyond the avoidance of pain, why should I care? And why do I seem to be programmed to resist my own death? Why does something as hard as life seem to have so much, well, value? Now, if you've never read the book of Ecclesiastes, I'm going to encourage you, even if you're not religious, to give this book a chance because, well, there are some really profound thoughts in here that have stood the test of time. Listen to this, starting in verse 11. He, and that's God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Now, I think we might want to spend a whole program one of these days talking about what beauty actually is. But here, here comes the important part. Listen. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. That is one of the most deceptively simple things I've ever read, because in seven words, the author points to the one thing that keeps us from believing that life has no meaning. He says, God has put eternity in our hearts. You know, a few years ago, a good friend of mine, who I, I think I'll invite on the show at some point, he suddenly called me and urged me to go to a website because they had posted the details of a notable funeral that had just taken place. It was a memorial service for Douglas Adams, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And of course, Douglas Adams was what we would call a nihilist, a person who believes that our existence doesn't mean anything. And in his book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, he imagines this race of aliens who destroy our planet to make way for a galactic freeway, like you and I are just an inconvenient ant pile on a construction site. So from the alien's perspective, the human race, all of our achievements, all of our history, all of our philosophy, it means nothing. And you could just wipe it out without any consequence. It's kind of like what happens in H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, where to our horror we discover that the Martians are here to harvest us for food. It's horrific because somewhere deep in the human psyche we have this instinct to believe that we are more important than that. So in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the author pretends that our Earth was nothing but an experiment, a supercomputer designed by another supercomputer and its purpose was to ponder the meaning of life and it was supposed to calculate the answer to, and I quote, the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. So, this computer works on that problem for seven and a half million years, and then it finally spits out the answer. The answer, 42. Now, of course, 42 doesn't mean anything. 
And what Douglas Adams is trying to tell us is that the search for meaning is pointless. But then he himself dies like we all do, and a number of very prominent people, mostly with the same mindset, they come to the funeral. And that's when it suddenly happens. Richard Dawkins, one of the most notorious atheists in the world, gives a eulogy. And I want you to listen to what he said because it confirms what the book of Ecclesiastes says. God has put eternity in our hearts. He, he mentions an interview he once had with Douglas Adams, and he asks his friend the question, what is it about science that really gets your blood running? And here's the answer that Douglas Adams gave. I, I don't want you to miss this. He said, the world is a thing of utter inordinate complexity and richness and strangeness that is absolutely awesome. I mean the idea that such complexity can arise not only out of such simplicity, but probably absolutely out of nothing, is the most fabulous, extraordinary idea. And once you get some kind of inkling of how that might have happened, it's just wonderful. And the opportunity to spend 70 or 80 years of your life in such a universe is time well spent as far as I'm concerned. Now, I don't know about you, but that does not sound like a man who believes in nothing. I mean, no matter how hard he fights it, there is still this idea that you and I are supposed to mean something, that we're here for a reason. And there is a right way and a wrong way to spend this one short lifetime. So that's what Douglas Adams said. Now let me read you what Richard Dawkins said at the funeral, because sometimes the words we speak and the thoughts we have when we're by the grave are some of the clearest thoughts we'll ever have. Here's what he said. It has been our privilege to know a man whose capacity to make the best of a full lifespan was as great as was his charm and his humor and his sheer intelligence. If ever a man understood what a magnificent place the world is, it was Douglas. And if ever a man left it a better place for his existence, it, it was Douglas. It would have been nice if he'd given us the full 70 or 80 years, but by God, we got our money's worth from the 49. Now, don't miss this. Richard Dawkins, a man who says there is no God, no plan for the universe, just had the nerve to tell us that Douglas Adams lived life well, that he used his time wisely. And then he says that the world was somehow cheated when this man died at 49 and he didn't get a normal lifespan. In other words, he's saying, what happened isn't fair. So why would that matter? I mean, if this is a perfectly mechanical universe, Douglas Adams was just a weaker machine who suddenly dropped dead of a heart attack. And he was 49. That's just a numerical fact. And we shouldn't have any emotions about that. But there's some kind of driving force buried deep inside us that says, no, there's something wrong with death. This man should have lived longer and all of us lost something the day he died. So why would we think like that? Why would we think there was anything fair or unfair about life? And apparently on another occasion, Richard Dawkins even talked about how exciting it was that Douglas Adams was going to decompose and his body would become nutrients to feed the plants and trees. And so in that way, he kind of gets to keep on living. Now, I didn't hear those words for myself, so maybe he didn't actually say it, but I will say this. When it comes to death, we all start to think that way. Because every time somebody dies, something inside of us screams, this is wrong, it's not supposed to be like this. So where in the world does that come from? I'll pick up on that thought right after this break. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers and guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and a second chance at life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions.
Well, we're back from the break, and the director tells me it's been driving him nuts that I left the tablet laying on the table this way. But I gotta tell you, I don't fix things like this, so Joel, get, get in here and fix the tablet, man. Fix the tablet. This is quality television. Oh, come on, man, what did you, fa you failed a Syrian school. That's upset. Oh. Good help, folks. Hard to find. Unless you give to keep authentic on the air, we're never gonna get decent help. Back to our subject. About 3,000 years ago, a wise Jewish king tried to tell us that God put eternity in our hearts. There's a reason that life feels unjust. There's a reason that it bothers us when it feels meaningless. Because this is not the way it's supposed to be. Life is not without meaning. And it only seems that way because something has gone horribly wrong. Listen, your, your logic might tell you that death is inevitable. It's just a part of the circle of life. We all put in a few years and then we buy the farm just like every other living thing. But every time you lose a person, someone you love to the ravages of death, every fiber of your being begins to protest. Think about how it feels to stand by the grave of a friend or a family member. Where did those emotions come from? Why do you hate the idea of death so much? I mean, logic told you the moment was going to come. It was guaranteed. So why in the world do we have so much trouble accepting that? And when it comes time to face your own death? Well, for some reason, that bothers you too. Maybe even more than losing somebody else. So what is the point of life? Acquiring skills, improving your mind, only to have it all disappear the moment you die. There are billions of people who have already been buried in everything they are, everything they believed, everything they learned. It's just God. It seems wrong. Then if you listen carefully to the narrative of human existence that you find in the average high school textbook, it really starts to get depressing. What we're told is that the universe is some 14 billion years old and that human life, conscious existence, only began to emerge in fairly recent history. And if the universe plays out the way the math seems to suggest, life is going to disappear in the relatively near future. And so our whole existence, everything we are, is only going to be a very brief interlude on a very long timeline in an otherwise empty and meaningless universe. And that might be what the math tells us. But somewhere deep inside our hearts, it's telling us that can't be the truth. Look, I'm convinced there's a reason we all seem to be trying to figure out who we are and what we're doing here. And that's because somebody put you here on purpose and he wants you to ask these kinds of questions. There's a reason you want to know. And there's a reason you were born with a, well, fuzzy memory of a better time and a better place. It's because you were born with eternity in your heart. So what does that mean? Well, if there is a purpose to life and you are not some miserable accident and somebody out there thinks that your existence means something, well, then maybe there really is such a thing as an authentic human life, a right way to do this. And I know it's no longer popular to suggest that there might be a right way and a wrong way to live. What we're told is, well, we can just create our own reality, our own sets of truths, and then live by those truths to the best of our ability. In other words, they're saying, the only right way to live is whatever you happen to think the right way to live is, because there's no meaning out there apart from that. But you know, as, as much as we try to convince ourselves of that, something tells us that can't be true, because we all recognize the wrong way to live whenever we see it. I mean, think about somebody who wastes this one precious lifetime. They never go to work. They never try to accomplish anything. They never invest in themselves. They just sit on the couch playing Xbox and drinking beer day after day. All of us look at that and we say, what a waste, because we realize what a precious gift life is. And there's not enough of it to spend the bulk of it doing nothing. Everybody can see when somebody's doing it wrong. And if that's true, then maybe there is a way to do it right. I'll come back right after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. 
Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh. There's a reason that this seems so very timeless. It feels right. There really does seem to be a time for things and a time when it's not time for those things. It's, there's a rhythm to life, an implied purpose. You know, maybe something that seems like a number one hit from 1965 might be worth looking at one more time. Because the birds were asking the same question the human race has always been exploring. To everything there is a season. And if that's true, I kind of want to know what my season is. Why am I here? And am I here right now for a particular moment in this universe's history? How long will my season in this place last? And at the end of the road, when I finally cross life's finish line, will I know, will I have any way of knowing that I did life the right way, the way that I was expected to? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about that one thought until the next time you and I get together and, and talk again. Now, if you can't go that long, just go to voiceofprophecy.com, and I've got a world of resources there for you. We've got some of the best Bible study resources in the entire world. And if you click on the study tab, this is at voiceofprophecy.com. Click on the study tab, and you'll find the resources I'm talking about, and easily there is enough there to keep you busy until we can meet again right here next week. What I really want you to do is to start digging and then keep digging and digging and digging until you and I find the answers that give us some peace of mind. I mean, think about it. Are you really here by accident? Is the universe an accident? Does none of this mean anything? That's what the math might tell you. That's what the scientists might tell you. But something deep in your heart, the eternity planted in your heart tells you it's got to be more than that. It can't just be an accident. Ask yourself, why does the question even bother you? My name is Sean Boonstra. Thanks for joining me this week. Until next time, this has been Authentic.